Good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, to Rock Solid Live. It is June 17th here, 2020. I'm Brother Tyler Fox right here in Calico Rock. I'm, of course, a youth and children's pastor here at First Baptist Church, Calico Rock. We are so glad that you're joining us. Um, we are excited to get deeper into our study of the Gospel of Mark. We are in week two. This is going to be a 12-week study, so this will cover us all the way through summer. So we're excited to be doing it and to be able to do it with you. So last week we kind of did an overview. We kind of talked about everything that we're going to cover, kind of about the Gospel of Mark and, you know, how is it different than the other three Gospels and just kind of some background on all the Gospels. And, you know, the, the thing that we need to understand, we said a little last week, is basically, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all the same story. They're the story of Jesus Christ. But if you study these four Gospels, they are different. And the reason they're different is because different people wrote them. And so, you know, the Gospel of Mark's a gospel that I've never studied in depth before, so I'm excited to be able to go through it. I enjoy, you know, preparing every week and kind of um, doing it. So basically, you know, we're going to cover a little bit every week. I'm going to read the verses, and then we're just I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. So hopefully at home, wherever you are, it's good for you. And the goal in this is for you to dig deeper into this gospel. Because just like all four Gospels, this is the good news. This is the story of Jesus Christ. And, you know, Mark, you know, a lot of people believe that Mark is trying to write this Gospel. His original audience was Romans, which is very interesting because, of course, during the time of Jesus, you know, the Israelites were slaves to the Romans. Uh, the Israelites were free in appearance, but really the Romans had power over them. And yet Jesus loved the Romans just like he loved everyone. And so we're going to start tonight. We're going to read Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. I'm going to be reading out of the Christian Standard Bible. So if you're following along or used to another translation, some words might be different. Um, but this is a really good translation. And so we're going to read it tonight. So Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John wore a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, One who is more powerful than I am is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels were serving him. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As he passed alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they are fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat putting their nets in order. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. All right, so that's the first 20 verses of chapter 1. That's what we're going to cover tonight. And so I just kind of want to touch base with a few things. And like I said, I hope that you read that. I hope you kind of study that on your own. Um, but here's some things I just kind of want to cover. So, you know, once again, we believe John Mark wrote this gospel. We believe that John Mark is the same John Mark we see in Paul's writings and in the book of Acts um, as the one who went with Paul and Barnabas uh, during that first missionary journey. Uh, we believe, of course, you know, halfway through that journey, he quit. He went back home. And then on the second journey, Barnabas wanted him to go with him. Paul said no. And that's why Paul and Barnabas 
went different directions was because they couldn't agree on John Mark. So we believe that John Mark um, is the same John Mark who wrote this. Uh, John Mark, his mother was, we believe, one of the Marys, possibly the Mary who actually had the upper room in which Jesus and his disciples were at during the Last Supper. So if this was that John Mark, this is someone who, no, he was not one of the 12 disciples, but he was very close to the disciples. He was very close to the early Christian movement. And, of course, we see here him writing this gospel. A lot of people believe that actually he wrote this gospel with Peter. And so, you know, we talked about last week how this gospel is, I mean, it's very quick. You know, it doesn't have the details. I mean, look here in chapter 1. You, there's no genealogy. There's no birth of Jesus. I mean, where does verse 1 start? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, boom, it goes to John the Baptist. And so we see here that when Mark wrote this gospel, he didn't write it uh, to give you all the details like we see with Matthew and Luke. No, his goal in this gospel is to give you the actions of Jesus, less teaching, more actions. We see more miracles recorded in this gospel than the other three gospels. And so that's very important to take note of. Now, of course, this gospel begins with John the Baptist. Um, it says right here, as is written, Isaiah the prophet, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Who was John the Baptist? John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. He was the one who was coming before the Messiah. Now, we, of course, know John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. If you look at Matthew, you see background John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was the older cousin of Mary. Uh, she believed not to be able to have a child. Of course, when God told Zechariah that Elizabeth would conceive, he didn't believe it. And of course, because of that, he could not speak. But God had a plan, and John the Baptist was the forerunner. So what I mean by the forerunner of the gospel is John the Baptist had a very specific role. And that role was to be the prophet, the messenger, the one who told people, hey, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, get ready. That was his whole ministry. His ministry was very different than Jesus. He didn't have the miracles Jesus had. He, of course, did not die on the cross. His ministry was to get people's attention and to get them focused on who was coming. So we see here that his goal, his ministry, was to prepare the way for the Lord and to make his path straight. Now, beginning in verse 4, we see more context of the ministry of John. Uh, he came baptizing in the wilderness. He was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, the Jewish people saw this baptism before. But usually the only time that a person was baptized in that culture at that time was when a Gentile, a non-Jew, started to have, basically he became a Jew. They would baptize him. They would they would say his old life was gone, now this is his new life. So these people are coming to John, not because they're joining Judaism, but they're coming to John the Baptist because he said, listen, repent and be baptized. So this was not simply a bath in the middle of the Jordan River. There was a reason they're being baptized. They're being baptized because they were repenting of their sins and they're confessing that they needed a Savior. So repent is very important. You know, repent is not simply, hey, I feel bad about my sins. I'm feeling convicted. Let's make a, a, a decision. No, repentance is turning away from your sin, knowing you need something greater than yourself. And so he was preaching repentance. And verse 5, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. People were coming to John. Why? Because John was a powerful preacher. He was a bold preacher. Uh, verse 6, he wore a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. John was not your normal guy. Think about what these people were used to. They were used to the rabbis, the teachers. They were used to people who preached in, in synagogues and temples. They were not used to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a different kind of cat. But he was preaching something that they were not used to being heard. See, the problem is at that time in Judaism, 
the teachers of the law, the same teachers of the same Pharisees who would clash with Jesus, were not teaching pure doctrine. They were teaching watered-down doctrine because they took the Word of God in the Old Testament and they began to change it because the Word of God was not fitting what they wanted. John the Baptist did not change the Word of God. John the Baptist did not say, hey, I want to make it, I want to change it. No, John the Baptist was teaching what God laid upon his heart, and that was repent. What did he proclaim? Look at verse 7 here. One who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here's what I love about John. John the Baptist is one of my favorite characters in the Bible because John understood his role. He understood his ministry. John knew his ministry was one task. Get people ready for Jesus. Imagine if your entire ministry was simply to point people to the main event. You weren't the main event, but you were pointing people to the main event. Well, guess what? If you're in ministry in any way, if you're a youth leader, a preacher, any kind of teacher, your job is the same thing. We are not the main event. I'm not the main event. Any preacher is not the main event. Our whole reason of teaching and preaching the gospel is the point towards Jesus. It's not about us. It's about someone who is greater. John the Baptist understood this. John understood that he was not the main event. John understood that, yes, at that time, he had a very important role, but it was not going to be forever because Jesus was coming. The Messiah was coming. And guess what I love about John? He understood it and he followed it. He didn't fight it. Sometimes we want to be the show, right? Sometimes we want people to listen to us. Instead of pointing them to Jesus, we want them to listen to what we have to say. But Jesus wants us to point towards him because he is greater. And John understood that. All right, verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as he came out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. What is happening in these verses? Well, Jesus finally came. Now, he's 30, he is 30 years old. He's about to begin his ministry, and he begins his ministry by being baptized. Now, here's a question. Why does Jesus Christ get baptized? Did he have to get baptized? No. Jesus is the Son of God. He did not have to get baptized. But the reason that Jesus got baptized is because he was demonstrating what we need to do. He was showing what we need to do. Remember, John the Baptist is preaching. John the Baptist is saying, hey, you know, this is what you need to do. God laid this on my heart. And Jesus is verifying the ministry of John the Baptist by he himself being baptized by John. And so Jesus is baptized. And once he comes up, uh, something powerful happens. The heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. We see God speaking we see the Holy Spirit coming down, and we see Jesus rising from the water. We see the Trinity. This is beautiful right here. Uh, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. So how does the ministry of Jesus begin? It begins right here. And that's why the Gospel of Mark starts right here, because Mark begins with the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And so the, bapti the baptism of Jesus is very important. Now, quick, quick note. Um, Baptism is critical. Baptism does not save you. What does baptism do? Baptism shows the world, hey, I am different. What did John say? Baptize, repent, and be baptized. Repentance happens in our hearts. No one can see what happens in our hearts. If we repent, if we say, Lord, I need you, and we say, Lord, come in and cleanse my soul, no one can see that. They can see the effects of that. They can see our changed lives, but they can't see that take place. So baptism shows an outward display of an inward decision. So baptism of Jesus is just the beginning. Now, verse 12 and 13 talks about the wilderness. Now, if you look at the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, they go much more in-depth about this. They go in-depth about what happens in the wilderness. 
They talk about Jesus being tempted at least three times. And every time he's tempted by Satan, how would he survive that temptation? He would rely on the teaching of the Bible. He would rely on God's word. Now, Mark does not go into details here. All Mark says is immediately, that word immediately is in over 40 times in the gospel of Mark. 40 times we see that word immediately. Why? Because this gospel is a very fast-paced gospel. It says, immediately the Spirit drove him, Jesus, into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels were serving him. Now, 40 days, of course, huge. Uh, that 40 is big. Israel, they were in the desert 40 years. Of course, Moses, he was a shepherd for 40 years. Um, we see, of course, it rain on Noah day and night for 40 days. That 40 is a very important number. How long is Jesus in the wilderness? 40 days. Now, once again, we talked about last week. Different Gospels have different details. It's like if four of your buddies go on a vacation, y'all go to the same place. But if I asked the four of you to write a page about your adventures, would it be the same thing? No. You might write about one thing and your friend might write about another. So, Mark did not feel led to go in detail about this temptation, but he wanted you, the reader, to know that the Holy Spirit led Jesus out there. What does that mean? God wanted him to go. Now, you might say, why in the world does God want Jesus to be tempted? Well, Hebrews chapter 4 says that the Son of Man went through every temptation. Now, he had to go through a temptation to be able to understand what sin is. When he died on the cross, he went through everything. Jesus went through temptation. You and I go through temptation every day. Now, the angels were serving him. Also, it's just kind of important to note, uh, verse 13, it says he was with the wild animals. We don't see that in the other Gospels. Uh, this is only in Gospel of Mark. You know, Tyler, uh, if I had my way, I would love to know what more that means. What does it mean he was with the wild animals? We don't know, um, but we just do know that Mark put that in there. So, verse 14, we see here, after John was arrested, we're back to John the Baptist. Like we said earlier, John the Baptist does not have a very long ministry, but he has a very effective ministry. It's not always about how long, it's about what do we do when the time God gives us. And John the Baptist was so effective during the time that he had. So after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. That's what the Gospels are. They are the good news. So this is the first time that we see Jesus speak in the Gospel of Mark. Um, your Bible, or you know, right now, tonight, I'm doing my Bible app on my phone. Um, the words of Jesus should be in red. So in the Gospel of Mark, uh, verse 15, this is the first time we see the words of Jesus. It says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, what is he saying? He's saying, listen, you need to pay attention. The Jews knew the Son of God was coming. The Jews knew the Old Testament. They were taught the Old Testament. The Old Testament said that the Son of Man, the Messiah, would come. What is Jesus saying? That time is now. Don't think it's going to come in your children's generation. Don't think it's going to come in your great-great-children's generation. It's coming right now. The time is now, and the kingdom of God has come near. Now, that kingdom of God, that's one of the key words in the Gospel of Mark. Now, the problem is, and we, are, we already talked about the Pharisees once, the Pharisees thought that the kingdom of God meant something very differently than what it actually did. See, the Pharisees wanted the kingdom of God to be an earthly kingdom. These Pharisees wanted basically King David 2.0, right? They wanted the kingdom of God to come down and to crush the Romans, and they wanted Israel to be an earthly power. That was what they wanted. The problem is that's not what God wanted. God wanted the kingdom of God to be something very different. And as we go through the Gospels, Jesus is going to talk about what the kingdom of God is. Jesus don't say, take down your enemy. Jesus says, love your enemy. And so sometimes we think we know what God needs to do. Clearly, the Pharisees felt like they knew what God should do. The problem is that is not what Jesus did. Jesus taught about the kingdom of God being very differently. 
And finally, in verse 15, he said, repent and believe the good news. Once again, that repent is not an emotion. It's not, man, I feel bad because I messed up. Repenting is being convicted of your sin and making a decision to turn away from your sin. Repent and believe the good news. So not only are you called to repent, but you are called to believe something else. Don't believe the world. Don't believe the false religion. Don't believe anything. What is Jesus saying? He says, believe the good news. Who's good news? Jesus' good news. The whole entire gospel is good news. Jesus says, repent and believe the good news. So, first words of Jesus. Powerful, powerful stuff right there. All right, the last little passage we're going to look at tonight, verses 16 through 20. We see the first four disciples called. Now, who are the first four disciples? Well, a little side note here. This is something I talk about a lot. You know, when Jesus came down, the 12 disciples are important. The 12 disciples are the 12 men who Jesus picked. And for over three years, they went with Jesus. They followed Jesus. Jesus poured into them. Jesus taught them. I mean, they went where Jesus went. I mean, the 12 disciples played such a big part. And when Jesus died on the cross and when he rose, when he ascended into heaven, who started the early church? These 12 men. Well, of course, 11. Uh, Judas the betrayer. But he was replaced. And so the role of the 12 disciples are critical. And who did Jesus choose? Outcast. The question is, why did Jesus choose the outcast? It's because the men who were trained their whole life to be men of the word of God, the men who were the leaders of the Israelites were who? They were the Pharisees. Could Jesus go to the Pharisees? Could the Pharisees become the disciples? No, because the Pharisees did not believe that Jesus was the chosen one. The one Pharisee that we saw that believed in Jesus was, of course, Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And when did he go see Jesus? In the night, because he did not want other people to know that he was looking at the teachings of Jesus and that he was believing in Jesus. And so instead of Jesus using the Pharisees, he had to use the outcast. He had to use the common man, the every man. And who was the first four disciples that we see? Matt, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Peter, who's also called Simon. Andrew, James, and John. What did these four men do? They were fishermen. Now listen, I'm a son of a blue-collar man. My daddy, he worked pipeline for 30 years, Okay. And so I respect that Jesus went to the blue collar. But, and to me, Jesus going to these four men, there is so much that we can look at. For one thing, it's this. No one is too low for serving Jesus. I mean, these were not seminary trained men. These were not men who knew the law inside and outside. These were simply men who allowed Jesus to become their master. The Pharisees would not follow Jesus. The Pharisees had too many titles. They had too big of a name. And they would not publicly say, hey, I'm following Jesus. But these fishermen, they stopped doing their job. They stopped their livelihood. And what? They followed Jesus. They forsook everything to follow Jesus. Now this is huge because this is discipleship. Discipleship is stopping doing what we want and doing what Jesus wants. And that is what we see with these four men. And once again, look at verse 20. Immediately, once again, that word, he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with them and followed him. Man. In verse 18, immediately, this is Andrew and Peter. They left their nets and followed him. These four men, when they were called... They acted in obedience, they acted in faith, and they followed Jesus. Man, listen guys, there's so much in these first 20 verses. You know, I'm looking forward to this Bible study in Mark. We're not going to be able to go super, super deep on every little thing, but we covered a lot tonight. We covered John the baptism, his role. We covered the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, uh, the very beginning of Jesus' words in verse 15, and of course the calling of the first four disciples. So we did cover a lot. Next week we're even going to get deeper. Uh, next week we'll cover Mark 
chapter 1, verses 21, all the way through chapter 3, verse 12. So we will cover a lot next week. Uh, that will be Jesus' early Galilean ministry. So we're going to get into some miracles. We're going to get into some teaching. That will be next week. So remember, we're only doing Rock Solid Live right now on Wednesday night, 7 p.m. We are doing something on Sunday nights. It's for students only going into the seventh grade all the way to our recent grads. Uh, that is something that we're doing called RBBA um, Youth or Virtual Camp. And that is for our students here and all over this area up here around Calico Rock. Um, we started it this past Sunday night. went really good. And we're just going to keep working at it, keep expanding in it. And we're really, really excited. So if you are a student, if you want to be involved in that Sunday night uh, ministry, it happens on Zoom, okay? And so not here on Facebook, it happens on Zoom. It starts at 8 p.m. Let me know. Uh, you can call, text me. Uh, most of you know my number, but my number is 501-773-5757. And you can just let me know that you want to be a part of it. I have to uh, invite you to that. It is led by college students. But if you're a youth student, we want you to do that Zoom on Sunday nights, 8 p.m. If not, next week, 7 p.m., we'll be back right here. And we are excited about it. Guys, thank you for joining us. Thank you for doing this Bible study, 12-week study, week two. Uh, next week, we'll get even deeper. All right, guys, I love you. Let's pray first. Father, Lord, thank you for letting us go through the text. Lord, thank you for letting us go through your gospel. Uh, Lord, it is true, the good news, and we need to hear the good news. Uh, Father, we love you. Lord, we just pray that you guide, direct, and lead everyone who's a part of this, Lord. Lord, help us to understand your teachings. Um, Father, Lord, let us understand that when you call us, Lord, we need to follow you. Father, we need to be obedient just like the disciples. We need to forsake what we're doing, and we need to trust and obey and follow. Lord, we ask you for this, Lord. We ask you, uh, Father, Lord, just help lead us. Lord, we ask this in your name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, we love you. We hope you have a great night. And uh, students, I'll see you Sunday night for 8 p.m. Zoom, and everyone else, I'll see you next week at 7 p.m. right here. All right, guys, see you later.